I'm Tim Reed, and I used to be famous. <laughs> um, I'm going to, because I understand some have to leave, so I'm going to go through this hopefully uh, quickly. But uh, I had to change my approach because I was um, I had come initially to speak to uh, the ladies and gentlemen of the press about career changes and, and, and the power of the media in terms of their expertise and how it can translate and also move into my area of uh, television and uh, film and documentary. But because we have some students, so I kind of have to do a hybrid presentation uh, to also hopefully uh, inspire uh, you to ask a few questions. So the first part of this will be more broad space, and then the last part, hopefully I will engage the, uh, uh, the professional journalists here about uh, opportunities and, and how I see their expertise being merged into the 21st century need to tell stories. Uh, as I said, I am, and I have always been, even before I knew I was, a griot, a storyteller. <clears throat> and uh, I was trained as a young kid to be a storyteller. I didn't realize it. And uh, I find myself now 40-something years in the business of doing the same thing, telling our story. Uh, as a kid, uh, we leave choir practice on Thursdays, and I'd stop by my grandmother's house with my father, and the first thing she would say, all right, you know, tell me what happened at church tonight, and we'd tell the story. Well, so-and-so fell down, and so-and-so was dating so-and-so. And as a kid, I was always at the knee of my grandmother, and she would always ask me, tell the story. Who, what happened? What happened? And I grew up being a storyteller. The problem that I find is that we have forgotten how important the oral tradition of storytelling is to a culture. And we uh, have allowed our culture to be put in the hands, and the mouths, and the ears, and the eyes, and the professionalism of someone other than our own cultural uh, uh, interest. Um, and that has been very detrimental to us as a people, no matter where we are. The African diaspora, wherever it is, and I have spent the last 18 years traveling the world studying the African diaspora and finding incredible stories and um, wherever I go, the tradition and the challenges are the same. But the first thing I want to say to both the journalists as well as uh, people who are aspiring to get into our business of uh, being in charge of your story, the word is first. And uh, no better way to start that than to hear this young lady tell us the importance. Mm -hmm. Words are things, I'm convinced. You must be careful about the words you use, or the words you allow to be used in your house. In the Old Testament, we are told in Genesis that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. That's in Genesis. Words are things. You must be careful. Careful about calling people out of their names, using racial pejoratives and sexual pejoratives and all that ignorance. Don't do that. Someday we'll be able to measure the power of words. I think they are things. I think they get on the walls. They get in your wallpaper. They get in your rugs, in your upholstery, in your clothes, and finally into you. That has been driven into me uh, more so. Applause. Thank you. Has been driven into me over my career, and uh, it hasn't always been a lesson that I've enjoyed learning. But um, about 20 years ago, uh, I was making a film called Once Upon a Time When We Were Colored. And I was shooting down in North Carolina, and uh, we had to do a scene. And the scene had been written, <clears throat> and um, Al Freeman, the late Al Freeman, a uh, powerful actor, um, was having problems delivering the lines. And not so much the lines, he just didn't believe it. He, said, he came to me and he said, Tim, I, 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 don't, I don't quite feel this. I'm not, I'm not feeling this. I, I think I'd say something different. I said, well, what is it, Al? He said, well, he said, you sure this is all right? I said, yeah, tell me what you're feeling. And he began to explain what he was feeling. And um, uh, I brought my, my wife's with me. I said, Daphne, come here, bring a pencil, a piece of paper. 
I said, again, express yourself. He expressed himself. She wrote it down. I said, okay, go type that up. And she left and went and typed it up and came back with about four pages of uh, scripted uh, material. And I handed it to him. And he looked at it. He looked at me. He said, uh, you want to shoot this? I'm going, yeah, let's shoot it. He said, don't you have to ask somebody? <laughs> I said, Al, I am somebody. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said something that I will never forget. He says, in all my years of acting, I have never had this opportunity to say what I felt and not have to go through a filter. And that, that point is when I decided, I said, you know what? I'm going to build my own studio. I'm going to take the money I've made over the years and build a studio so that I have control over the words, yeah. control over the stories, stories, stories. And that's what I did. And we built a studio in Petersburg, Virginia. And since then, we have been laboring. I have not been as successful as I had hoped. I, I admire and take my hat off to Tyler Perry for what he's done. Uh, it is an incredible challenge to do what we do. Um, <clears throat> why is it so important? Image propaganda as it relates to the people of African descent <coughs> around the world is mediocre at best. The internet age coupled with bad writing is destroying what little culture and integrity that manages to exist. <coughs> uh, I understand the happiness, but I wouldn't applaud that. <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a tragedy. It is, but um, it's a, you recognize it. We need to do something about it. We not definitely that, do. Not that the recognition is out there. And why is it important? Well, it's important for many reasons, but I had a lesson given to me in 1988. I happened to be called to New York. I had just uh, done a pilot for a show called Frank's Place, the gentleman mentioned. It. And the show was uh, confusing a lot of people at Black Rock. Black Rock is in New York. It's the headquarters for CBS Television Network. And um, at the top of this building is an office that takes up the entire floor for this gentleman here, the late William Paley. Now, the journalists here know who that is. Most of the young people don't know who William Paley is. He's passed away now. Uh, William Paley is the father of television. He created CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System, which is known as CBS. And he's responsible for the format of news reporting on television. Uh, he had the network and controlled it for many years and um, was responsible for some incredible careers of journalists from Walter Cronkite, Edward R. Merrill, and on and on and on. He was an interesting man. I had the pleasure of being asked to come and see him uh, he found out I was in the building, and he said, I want this gentleman up in my office. Well, when Mr. Paley calls, boy, things begin to happen. First thing they did was whisk me and my, my wife into a room and said, you have to be debriefed. I thought I was going to see the Pope. <laughs> so what do you mean debriefed? So you got to be debriefed. So for 45 minutes, the president of the network at that time, Tom O'Leary, was nervous. I mean, he was more afraid than I was. Um, now, I don't know if you saw the movie Good Night, Good Luck about Edward on Earth with, with, with the Clooney. Well, there's a scene in that movie where Franklin Langella plays William Paley, and, and George Clooney has to go up to his office. And in the movie, it's black and white, but in the movie, you get some concept of power. Because it's one elevator, true, that goes from the ground up 60-something flights to his office. One elevator, and it'll only be taken by someone who's invited to get on the elevator. So you get on this elevator, you go up, the door opens, and the room is about the size of this room flat. It's a huge room. And in this room, there's a, two sofas, some plants, a desk with a woman behind it, and nothing else but beautiful art all around the wall. Beautiful art, originals, Grecos, you name it. And you get in there, it's so big you get an echo. Hello, hello, I'm here to see Mr. Paley, Paley, Paley. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you, Tim Reed, Tim Reed? And they said, all right, have a seat. And you sit there. You feel, you are intimidated. You feel like, oh my God, I'm, I, this is a day of judgment. <laughs> so finally, after about 15 minutes of sitting there, she said, you can go in now, now. <laughs> now, here's the problem with that meeting. That day, I didn't know I was going to see Mr. Paley. Matter of fact, Mr. Paley had not seen an actor since Jackie Gleason. 
So the fact that I was going in, everybody in CBS, right? Everybody in CBS was, was like, why, why do they want to see this guy? So anyway, I go in the office. But what I, I realized as I was walking in, I happened to have on that day some of the worst colors that I've ever <laughs> worn. Because it's hot, it's like 90 degrees in New York, I had on some yellow pants, <laughs> sandals, and a shirt that looked like a peacock threw up on it. <laughs> My wife is dressed impeccably. <laughs> and I'm going, not today. Why would I see Paley in yellow pants? <laughs> We go into his office, we shut the door on a Rodin. On the wall, there must be 30, 40 million dollars worth of paintings. I mean, it's just, you go, my God, this is real. We sit down, he sat, just like in the movies, with his back against a window with the sun blazing through it. So all you see is a silhouette of this old man who then had to be 80 something years old. And we sat down and we chatted for a few days, um, for a few minutes. And I'm sitting there the whole time, so self-conscious about these yellow pants. And then he looked at me, and he said, young man, I've seen your show, and I like your show. As a matter of fact, I would have been proud to have it on the network when I ran it. And he looked at me, and he asked me a question that changed my life that day about media. He said, what is your propaganda? And I went, whoa. And suddenly, I was awake. I can't believe the man who found the television is asking me, what is my propaganda? I've used the word ever since. And I, and I spoke to him. I said, well, Mr. Palin, it was, uh, I was blessed to be able to touch my brain and my, and my lips to work them together. <laughs> I said, you don't know my culture. I said, I have not seen my culture as I know it on television ever. I said, there are people in a community that I grew up in in Norfolk, Virginia, that most people will never know. I said, my show is designed to introduce to America a group of people with character that are just unbelievable. And he said, are you going to keep the writers? I said, the writers who stay. He says, well, I, I wish you well. So what did I learn from that? The power of propaganda. W.B. E. Du Bois said, all art is propaganda. All of them. I would care what form it comes in, newspaper, radio, painting. It is the propaganda of the artist. One of my favorite pieces, and my, I'm, I'm a, I'm a half-assed sculptor, and I study it uh, in Florence occasionally. And I love Florence because the history of that place is just unbelievable, not only the art. And I stand in front, I usually have an apartment near the academia where they have the David. And I stand often in front of the David just for hours just watching this incredible piece of, of art done by Michelangelo. And there's one thing if you notice the next time you see the David, David isn't circumcised. But he's supposed to be the king of the Jews. Impossible. You're not circumcised. So who is David? David is, and also the age of David in the, in the, in the book of Genesis, I mean not the book of Genesis, when, when David uh, conquered Goliath, he had just turned uh, a man. He was 13, 14, a young person. Who is this David, this man of 20-something years old that's passing for David? Well, he is a radical. This man is a radical who fought against the Catholic Church in France, I mean, in, in, in Florence. And Florence was constantly battling the Pope, whoever the Pope was. And Michelangelo was a radical. So that statue is a political statement, a stab in the eye of the Catholic Church. All art is propaganda. Hmm. <coughs> Picture is worth a thousand words. We've heard that so many times. Imagine a thousand words, one picture, one frame, one frame of a picture, and there are like 24 frames in a second. That's a lot of power. And one of the things that <clears throat> I've noticed in working with young filmmakers, writers, is that I think we have forgotten the power of words. That's why I started with uh, my Angelo statement. The power of images and what it can do to change the thinking, the attitudes of people, we have forgotten our power. And I try every chance I get to reinforce any creative person, no matter what medium they work in, of their power. Once you understand your power, you become more responsible for your message. You know, a lot of young folks will come to me and bring me their films to look at, and they'll say, look at this film. It could be about anything. 
crack. I just, I don't know what these young people write about. <laughs> but I see these films, and I ask them, what's your purpose? They go, what do you mean? I said, what's your purpose? And they said, I want to make a lot of money. That's a byproduct. What's your purpose? Most of them don't have a purpose. I looked at the, the latest, I try to keep abreast of what's going on in the media. Uh, uh, what's the young lady uh, um, and, uh, with the big butt? What's her name? <laughs> no, 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 not that one. Nikki, thank you, thank you. She, she manufactured that one. I looked at her latest uh, video, Anaconda, and it is, it is really, from my point of view, uh, a waste of power. But I do not, and I'm against censorship of any kind, I do not go against her for doing it. But if I had the opportunity to meet her, I wouldn't attack her. I would ask her one question. What is your purpose? Yes. What do you want young 13, 14 year old women to do? What is your purpose? I'd ask the same thing to Beyonce. What is your purpose? Mm -hmm. Why are you talking about surfing this and doing that? What is your purpose? We need to really get into that as creative artists, always try to find the purpose, because hidden in the purpose is the propaganda. <clears throat> All artists are the gatekeepers of truth. We are the, we are the civilization's radical voice. If you're going to be creative, and you don't have any radicalism in yourself, do something else. <laughs> Please, <laughs> because you're wasting the power of images. You're wasting the power of the word, the written word. Malcolm X says, the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty, to make the guilty innocent, and that's power, because they control the minds of the masses. Purpose. And that's what's happening to us for now. We got a president who, given any other birthright, any other time in history, would be considered one of the most successful presidents that a country could have. Unemployment is at 5.7. There have been more billionaires created in the last uh, years of his administration than 10 of the presidents before him. Billionaires. Wall Street is at high. We now are independently uh, in terms of a power and fuel, never before. They were always talking, yeah, we're going to make our country independent, dependent on, on oil. We're now independent. None of that goes in. Why? Because of the power of media. We have been told and we have bought that he's a failure. He didn't believe in it. That's the power of media. <clears throat> the power of images to create perception and define reality. You know, we was, as a kid, when I was in school, we were reading, uh, uh, we were worried about um, what was going to happen in 1984. Orwell had written this wonderful book, 1984. We're all, oh my God, I remember thinking about it. What is the world going to be like when 1984 comes? Will we be a police state? What's going to happen? We'll be burning books. Of course, 1984 came. And we missed a book. And the book was written by Aldous Huxley. Brave New World. <laughs> and in that book, he says, I'm not worried about people burning books. I'm worried about people not wanting to read a book. He says, I'm not worried about the reality of stormtroopers and police state. I'm worried about the fact that perception becomes reality. I remember President Bush saying, the most important thing is the perception of power, not the reality. We now live in a world where perception is more powerful than reality. And who creates perception? You do. Writers, producers, television. Who are the most trusted people in news today? John Stewart. They even wanted him to host uh, Face the Nation. John Stewart, a comedian with great wit. Bill Maher, he and I hate each other, I almost knocked him out one time. <laughs> but he is very successful. And he defines the presidency. He, uh, if, if Cornell goes on that show one more time, I'm going to throw up. 
You now have this a new guy on HBO, um, Sunday, Saturday, the last week, um, what's his name? Oliver. Uh, what's his name? John. John Oliver. I was watching him this past uh, weekend. He had an incredible show where he tore up the, the perception of lottery. I don't know if you saw that, but if you can, don't hit a rerun. Look at that show because it's, matched, it's made the newspapers. It was on Huffington, his show. And what he talked about was the illusion of the lottery. Now, y'all, you young folks know it as a lottery. Anybody over 40 knows it was what we used to call the numbers. <laughs> Another one of our things that they took and made it legit. They used to put you in jail for playing the numbers. <laughs> Trying to make a free combination for 50 cents. <laughs> now it's called the lottery and it's legit. And they tell you the reason for the lottery is that they're going to finance schools. And he broke down every declaration from these states, New York. And, you, and he had people saying, yes, $50 million is going to go to education. And then he showed the reality. The money didn't go. This lottery business that are putting mostly poor people and lower class people in debt playing the lottery, billions and billions of dollars are going somewhere. And he broke it down. He's a comedian. Where are the news people telling these stories? Why aren't they telling these stories? Well, I'll tell you in a minute why. <clears throat> there are 1,500 newspapers or more, 1,100 magazines, 9,000 radio stations, 1,500 TV stations, 2,400 publishers, owned by only three corporations. There it is. It's <laughs> always the worst. <laughs> That's an amazing fact. Three corporations control 90% of everything we see, hear, read, right? Entertainment, propaganda. William Pale, what is your propaganda? So consequently, these corporations define power. We're no longer in a democracy. I know we call it that. We're an oligarch. We have wealthy people controlling politics, everything. It's a different world we live in. So as creative people, you have to understand what your job is. Your job is to get through that system. Your job is to use the tools at hand. Not 20th century tools, 21st century tools. That's one of the problems that most of us are having now, especially those of us who are trying to get in. We're still trying, we're trying to reach a 21st century mentality with 20th century tools. You're not going to make it. You've got to get up to speed with 21st century tools so that your propaganda is distributed properly and meet the people that it has to meet to get your story told. If Du Bois is correct, all art is propaganda, then the culture will live or die by its ability to control its propaganda. If you don't control your propaganda, you will be controlled by it from someone else. It's just a fact. <clears throat> I know you've heard this many times, but I always like to put it. Until lions have their historian, tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunt. Mm. That is so true. Your job is to speak for the lion. That's what I do. I don't care about the hunter. I care about the lion. Why? Because that's what I am. I'm a radical storyteller. Telling the story of the hunter, these are just facts. And there's a reality to the fact that the hunter has killed the lion. We can't change reality. It is what it is. Facts are facts. Outcomes are outcomes. However, the story, the legend of that, should be retold to benefit the culture. It's time for the lion to have a story told. What kind of lion was it? Was it a cowardly lion? was the character of the lion. We don't pay any attention to that. You've got to be able to speak for the lion because he's half of the story. The power of propaganda to influence opinion. That's what you do. That's what the journalists do. That's what you have to do in mass comm. They don't call it mass communications for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it is called mass 
communication. I'm always amazed at students who major in mass communication who do not communicate. I'm amazed. You don't ask questions. You sit back and say, I want to be a journalist. I want to be a newscaster. Splitting birds. <laughs> you're not training your, you're not training your skill. I look at your, your uh, uh, audiovisual uh, building over there. I went in last night for the first time. I'm amazed at the tools you have before you. You don't understand the tools you've got. I've gone to a lot of historically black colleges. And I'm telling you, this is the best I've seen in terms of tools. They are still thinking that you need to be taught with tools that are no longer useful. Five years ago, not less, I'm sorry, less than five. Yeah, five years ago, the word iPad did not exist in our vocabulary. iPad did not exist. In less than five years, hundreds of millions of iPads have been made. And a lot, hundreds of millions of Chinese now have jobs. <laughs> so either learn Mandarin Chinese or develop something yourself. So the, tail, the two tails and tools have to come together and we have to use if we're going to influence propaganda. Speaking of propaganda, uh, this one film has done more to damage the culture of black America than anything ever created. This film, based on a book, The Klansman, by Dixon, was seen and ran in first run around the world for about 10 years. Woodrow Wilson, who was president at the time, said that this film best described the Negro problem in America than anything ever shown. This last scene here is one of my I hate to use the word favorite scene. But this scene is supposed to be the South Carolina con uh, legislature. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, doing Reconstruction movies based on what was happening during Reconstruction. And look at the congressman picking the toes, eating chicken. Mm -hmm. You know that this scene is the only scene where they had actual black actors in the movie? All the other scenes were white actors in blackface. And how they got this scene done was they invited all these black guys into this set. And they said, we're going to give you, I think it was like $20 or $25. Now remember, this is during hard times. And they said, yeah, what do we do? I said, oh, I'm just going to bring some chicken in. You just pick your toes, eat chicken. And they did the scene, not knowing what the scene was about. Well, this movie and the book, the book written, um, Klansman, sold, get this, back in the turn of the century, five million copies. So this became the preamble for black culture in America. This set us back all the way to the civil rights movement in the 60s. That's the power of images. As a matter of fact, um, Oscar Micheaux, those of you who ever heard of Oscar Micheaux, young folks? Mm -hmm. If you don't, Google it. <clears throat> Oscar Micheaux saw this movie in Chicago the night a riot broke out. There were riots what you don't know about the reality of this particular movie, black people didn't take this movie sit down. There were riots throughout America. Every time this movie showed, there were riots. There were, there were uh, black people really detested the images because it was so, so much propaganda against the reality of where we were. Remember, this is doing reconstruction. This, this period is supposed to be covering reconstruction. So we knew that it was a lie, what was really happening, what had really happened. Well, Oscar Michaud saw this movie sitting in the theater. A riot broke out. Some people were injured in Chicago. And he walked out and said, I must learn how to control my image. And he began writing books and then turned those books into movies. Homestead. Within our, within our gates was an answer to this. And he became the first black filmmaker and still the most prolific filmmaker black that this country that the world has ever seen. He, um, he did the first talking, full-length talking. He did the first full-length uh, silent film. He did the first film ever shown on Broadway. He died a poor man in 1953 or 54. But it was his 
understanding of the power of images that changed his life and the lives of many film producers who made race movies to counter this image. We have work to do, people. The reality of the, of the Reconstruction Era look like, and dress like, and the perception that people bought into until the Civil Rights Movement is at the bottom. So perception has trumped reality. Um, <clears throat> remember the Anita Hill trial? The young people may remember. The thing that I most remember about that trial was every black person who knew a white person that day had to hear a white person say, I never knew him. Many, that many black people spoke so well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, if I had gotten that question, that question so many times, that was the first time that that generation of Americans, white, had seen black people in such a controlled situation. Now, we know that they're there, but you've got to remember the reality and the perception of the difference. The perception of us as a people Right now, what's the perception of us as a people? If you're not hip hop, who are the most famous people on, um, on the black planet here? Beyonce, Jay Z, P. Diddy, LeBron James. LeBron James, well, I'll get him today. These are the people that lead your perception, not the reality. Using media to shape opinions and define culture. That's what your job is. Mm -hmm. And you can make a lot of money doing it. Mm -hmm. Or you can become a tool mm -hmm. of the three corporations and fulfill their purpose mm -hmm. by spreading the propaganda for their good and their purpose. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. This is the greatest speech ever made. You Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world. Millions of despairing men, women, and little children. Victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed. The bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die. And the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate, only the unloved hate, the unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery, fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man nor a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie, they do not fulfill that promise, they never will. Dictators free themselves, 
but they enslaved the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! That speech was in a movie called The Dictator, and it was written and performed by Charlie Chaplin. And uh, the movie was so powerful that it helped shift the tide of thinking of Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. And it really drove the influence of, of us and other countries uh, rearing up and going against this tyrant. Uh, it is one of the greatest speeches ever written, uh, never performed. You might say, what are the other two that I have in mind? One, of course, is March on Washington. I happen to have been there that day. The other is the Gettysburg Address. Now, what do all three people who gave that speech had in common? The speeches are powerful. The speech giver were all either assassinated or had their careers ruined. Charlie Chaplin, after that speech, moved to America. He had to leave Europe because the assassins that Hitler had had to, to take him out, he came to America to hide out and was considered after the war being one of the most important voices of the uh, propaganda movement against Hitler. Well, the same man who wrote uh, The Klansman also wrote the first book to introduce the Red Scare, the fear of communism. And his pupil was a guy by the name of McCarthy. Well, he and McCarthy labeled Charlie Chaplin a communist and ran him out of this country into exile. He died in exile. Uh, and you know what happened to the other two gentlemen, the one who did March on Washington and the Gettysburg Address. Why? Because they understood the power of propaganda. And their power and message was so powerful that they were taken out. <coughs> it's real, folks. Uh, you may have not, I, I noticed her name has been showing more in the press lately, Sarah Bachman, uh, from the uh, Bush tribe in South Africa. She was considered the Venus Hottentot, the most beautiful woman in the world. And she was considered that based on her physique, which was part of the tribal rights uh, of this tribe in South Africa. She was paraded among people in England for years. People would stand in line for hours in the rain to pay 25 cents to just view her body. It's a very tragic story. Um, as you see, she died in her 20s. Her private parts were on display until 1985. The first official act of Mandela when he became president was to petition and force France to send back her body parts where they were finally buried in a tribal home. Now, what is the significance of this today? That's us. That's our propaganda to ourselves. The power of images. Back to the future. There's the bra. Look at this propaganda. You see stuff like that, you just let it go by. Oh, that's not It's propaganda. What does that say about the black male? Huh? Perception, reality. Be mindful about stereotypes. Only one of them is a convicted felon. <laughs> Images have been shared. If Du Bois is correct, all art is propaganda, then a culture will live or die by its ability to control its propaganda. Young people, and directly to you, you're at a university with the tools you need, up to date tools. 
one of the few universities that have this that I have seen in my travels. The only other one that I've had anything can match this is a, a school called uh, Savannah School of Art and Design, SCAD. They have a, they have a building, a, a complex in Atlanta, and they have one in uh, Savannah. That school is in the 21st century. You have 21st century techniques and tools in that building. Use them to understand how to use your power to get your propaganda to control your cultural story. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you have wasted your time and mine. <clears throat> Buckmaster Fuller, Google it. Um, he says, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. That's what we have to do. One of my pet peeves about us as a people and about how politics are being used, we're still using 20th century techniques to fight 21st century issues and problems. The civil rights era was so important to all of us. That's why many of us are here today. But we can't use those techniques today. They got us. They know how it's going to end. They've seen that. It just doesn't work. Your, your former uh, governor of the state, Barbara, was he a governor? Yeah. Yeah. What did he just say yes, two days ago? Tar babies. You relate to the president, it's tar babies. Now, where's the outcry? Nobody said anything. 20th century, he's using 20th century wounding words as my Angela said, words are powerful things. He knows what he was saying. He's using that 20th century stuff. We can't deal with that. We have to use 21st century tools, 20th century thoughts, and create a new dynamic, a new paradigm for us as a people. If we don't, we're going to hip hop right into oblivion. <laughs> To compete with the media propaganda machines of the 21st century, it will take passion, commitment, skill, and sacrifice. And last one, last but not least, you can ask any of these men and women here who have been in the business and carrying the, uh, the pail for some time, that they've had to make sacrifices, serious sacrifices. It's affected their, their lives, their financial, their personal, their health, this is a very serious business that you've chosen to get in and call mass communication. If you don't understand that, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Do you know it's easier to become a doctor in America than to become a filmmaker? If you go to any system of schools, practice after that, what is it, 12 years maybe? If you're going to specialize in a particular medicine or technique, eight years. When you finish eight to 12 years in medical school, you can get a job. Well, if you got a C or better, if you got under C, please don't practice medicine. <laughs> but, but if you got a C or better, you can get a job anywhere in the world. You don't even have to speak the language as a doctor. They need you. Now, film. You do eight years, 12 years, and you can wait tables anywhere you want to wait tables. <laughs> it doesn't matter. What matters in becoming a successful filmmaker is commitment, passion, skill, and sacrifice. Our business is dangerous. Why would a man who created what we call as television ask me, sitting in yellow pants, what is my propaganda? I have never forgotten that and will never forget that. It is propaganda that controls the minds and hearts of the masses. If you want to be a mass com and don't understand that, do something else. If you understand it, do it well, and you can help your culture in ways that have not even been dreamt of. You can change the perception of black males and black women. You can change the perception of someone. What are some of the problems? Most of the things that black people die of are lifestyle issues. Right. Black men won't go get checkups, so we die of prostate cancer more than anyone else. Black women. We won't do things that have to do with lifestyles, drugs, whatever it is, it's lifestyles. You can change that by changing the mindset of people with the power of the words, the powers of the pictures that you put out. <coughs> can you make a living doing it? Yeah. You can, if you do it well. And 
to make a point of creating your own space. Whether you like Tyler Perry's work or not, I don't particularly care. There's some of his stuff I look at, I can't watch all the way. But I admire him as a filmmaker and as a businessman. He took what I've been trying to do for 18 years. Not only did he make it work, he is financially set for the rest of his life and several generations of any family he has. Because he understood the power of his propaganda. And the other thing is, he understood his audience. He knew who his audience was. Same women who go to T.D. Jakes, go to all these other people. He understood and he fed them the propaganda that they wanted and accepted. And it's made him very wealthy. Yes, you can become very wealthy. The other thing it does for you, you talk to Spain off, you travel the world. I'm a little poor kid from Norfolk, Virginia, raised in segregation. I've been around the world twice. I've had dinners with presidents and kings. A little old kid from Color Town. The business can do that for you. But you've got to be good. You've got to sacrifice. And above all, you've got to have skills. If you don't have them, you'd be somewhere going, uh, you want lids on these? <laughs> <laughs> A good storyteller must be disciplined, able to condense facts, details, and opinions into thought-provoking infotainment. It's no longer information. It's infotainment. If you don't entertain, you will not get the viewer or the listener to stay with you for no time at all. The game has changed. There's no longer networks. There, you can create a network. I'm talking to my granddaughter the uh, last time I was in LA, and I'm telling her, I'm excited because I've broken down this project that I'm doing into small bites. I said, yeah, I've got <coughs> nine minutes. I'm going to do this web soul, web series, web episodes I've heard you guys talk about. She said, what? She said, no, you got to put it on Vine. Uh, I said, what's Vine? She said, oh, the latest thing. Some guy just become a millionaire. Just yeah. I said, what is Vine? Six seconds. I said, what? <laughs> yeah, six seconds. That's all. For mine. I just got used to Instagram doing 15 seconds. <laughs> now I've got to cut it down to six seconds. I tell you what, if I want to reach the young audience, the millennial generation, I better learn how to do it in six seconds. That's the task that I have to do. At my age and at where I am, I don't really want to do all this. <laughs> but I'm not going to retire. I got too many enemies. So I have to keep creating. And I have to learn the tools to reach you. And that's what I'll say to, if I may shift now over to the old folks. <laughs> <laughs> the word discipline, I put first because I learned the importance of dis discipline. From Mr. Wickham. He and I, uh, he hired me some almost 30 years ago, I guess it was. God, it was a long time ago, to come to Baltimore to do a project. And um, I forgot what it was, was some, some promotional piece on camera. And I went there. And I was very impressed with uh, Mr. Wickham in two fronts. One is that he was prepared when we got there, things were done. We went in, we got it done on time. The other was how he treated me. He treated me with a respect that I didn't even get in Los Angeles from folks, especially black folks. We don't respect one another. You know, we just don't. That crab and barrel series is getting stronger than it is. I'd like to see that left in the 20th century, but it isn't. You drag the crabs in the barrel in the 21st century, young folks. Leave it alone. But he, he did that. I said, wow. And we've been working together ever since. So when I had an opportunity to create a project, I thought, what I need now is someone who's disciplined. One thing about writers that I say of all writers, that news writers, the people who write and condense stories, are by far worth their weight in gold. Why? Because the discipline that he has, I'll tell you one of the disciplines that he has, he, when he's time to write his column, for you as a day, I don't care who you are or where you are, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> He's going to go sit in a room and write his column, however long it takes. 
I don't care if you're there to be entertained by him or you're at his house, you can forget it. He's in that column. That kind of discipline in writing is important. Anybody who wants to be a writer, one thing you got to remember, what do writers do? They write. And I ask you, well, yeah, I'm a writer. Yeah, how often do you write a day? Well, I mean, I, you know, I've got a story I'm working on. <laughs> if you don't write every day, you're not a writer. You will want to be right. <laughs> this guy will write. At one time, he, he, would, he would piss me off with his writing. I said, Dwayne, come on, man. I got tickets, front row tickets to the championship fight in Vegas. We're going to fly out, man. Come on. Dwayne said, uh, you go ahead. Front row seats at a Tyson Holyfield fight in Vegas at Caesar's Palace. <laughs> These tickets cost like $3,000. Dwayne. <laughs> There's a G4 waiting at Van Nuys Airport. Come on, man. I got to do this call. <laughs> I left him. <laughs> I can go to the fight. <laughs> He missed out on that was the ear biting fight. <laughs> he has left me in so many places to go to his college. Discipline. The discipline that I admire as a creative person. So when I needed somebody and I had a limited budget and a tight schedule and I needed a writer, I knew where to go. Dwayne, can you help me with this documentary? I need you to write it for me. What's the schedule? What's the subject? When do you need it? Bam, it was there. Not only on time, it was well done. And I discovered the way that journalists go after stories is why I think they will make great um, uh, documentary writers and also uh, fictional writers. Is that, and you guys in, in the younger group have to understand this, it requires research. It requires finding the facts, but not letting the facts dictate the story. They are storytellers. They, they go out and condense these incredible factual events into infotainment. Because if you read their column and you're not entertained, if they haven't gotten you in the first paragraph, you're going to turn the page and go to something else. So they have to have their lead line. What's the best writing, the best opening of any book? Well, the second best opening. The first is in the beginning. But the second best is, these were the worst, best of times. These were the worst of times. Incredible way to start a book. They got you. Well, writers, especially writers who write columns, who write these short art articles, are great in terms of transitioning into what I mean in terms of films. We have written about three films together. Well, two, I know at least. Uh, a couple of them have gone in development, and I'm going to make Judge Knight. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, we brought him in when I did a television series for, for uh, Showtime called Lynx. It was a political series, and it was about a black Republican uh, who owned a barn behind the hill. And I knew right then I needed Dwayne. I needed Dwayne's political point of view for this, right, for this guy. I needed someone who could be up to date with what was happening in Washington. And he became a staff writer with us. Um, <clears throat> There are needs of writers who can do that. Now, and, uh, and I'll kind of slow down here for any questions, but here's what I think is needed. Where, where are the opportunities? It's nice to say all these things, but where, where are the opportunities? I think the opportunities are, particularly right now in our, in our, in our history, in our culture, better than they've been in a long time. Why? Because so few people do anything well. The level of mediocrity in our business now is unbelievable. Do I have to say Kim Kardashian? <laughs> it's unbelievable who are stars today and who are driving the entertainment machine. Unbelievable. So quality and class and well-written stories still are important. And we have less time now because most of the millennials, they're looking at stuff in six, 15 second bites. So you gotta grab them right away. But they understand quality. There is a postmodern movement happening among millennials. Millennials actually are going back. Guess what's coming in now? Vinyl records. 
Millennials. They're discovering some parts of the past that intrigue them. They want to speak with elders. I started Legacy Media Institute uh, five years ago. And my idea was I needed an army. And all the people my age around my group burn out. They just burn out. They're ready to quit. I ain't ready to quit. I owe too much money. <laughs> and so I said, I better get with this group that right now the people care too much about, millennials, because I had bought into the propaganda of millennials. Then I started hanging out with millennials. I first went to England. I'm hanging out with these young filmmakers, independent thinking filmmakers. They don't care about the system. They're thinking about YouTube and what's happening in Nigeria, the movement of Nigeria. I'm going, what's going on? So I go to Nigeria. Nigeria is the second largest filmmaking country in the world. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, and it's all underground. It's all, it's all like, I mean, there is no system. The government, I met with the Minister of Culture, they were saying, can you help us? We don't know how to control this. <laughs> it's, it, matter of fact, I don't know if you, those who travel, and I, I know my, my group here will testify, I have yet to go anywhere in the world anywhere where I didn't find a Nigerian with a blanket selling incense <laughs> and knock off Louis Vuitton. I have not, have you ever been anywhere and didn't find a Nigerian? <laughs> when I went to Nigeria, they asked me, so you got a question? Yes, can somebody take me for a tour of the knock off Louis Vuitton factory? <laughs> well, this is what they do now. You want to buy a movie, a, a, a Nigerian movie? Find a guy who's selling knockoff Louis Vuittons and incense, because he's also selling the movies. They got their own system. They bypass, blockbuster, YouTube, all of it. Multi-billion dollar system that they created. A new paradigm. And we're trying to figure out why black films don't sell overseas. Get out of here. So these young filmmakers are different, and I start working with them. Nigeria and England, Trinidad, and thanks to Dwayne and a few in Cuba. Uh, it's a fascinating business for them, and they're doing things that are going to change the face of black filmmaking in their particular countries. We in this country are still stuck in the system, those three corporations. You got to break the yoke. You can make money today just selling to folks who look at movies on these little things. But you got to control the system. And if there isn't one, create one. Any questions? Uh, thought? Yes. Yes. In the thought? What's it? It's the bottom line. Oh, oh. Oh, it's spelled wrong. Yes, yes. Okay. I didn't think I didn't. I thought I had an autocorrect. <laughs> I'm getting lazy. Um, uh, to the to the uh, to the area of possibilities, especially to, to the uh, seasoned veterans and writers, I think there's an opportunity in this country in particular for um, a group to form a distribution or a, a home-based network of information and infotainment that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. If you look at where we get information, look at the defense of our president, where is it coming from? Bill Maher, John Stewart, and a few others. What's missing in our culture right now is wit. Mm -hmm. We have no wit. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people regurgitating the thoughts of the propaganda machine and I would hate to see Cornell and a few of us fall in that category, but they are. Where is the wit? Where are the journalists, the writers who are online, in their individual visuals, saying with wit the kinds of thought-provoking things, or thought-provoking things, <laughs> that, um, that this culture needs in order to combat the negative propaganda that we're getting uh, from the corporate oligarchies who control the thought machines. We don't have it. 
So I think there's a way to do that. I think you do it with documentaries. I think you do it with, a, we're going to create a program, uh, I'm actually talking with Jack White, and I'm certainly going to come with money on it, but I want to create a, a program called Black Action. Oh. And the concept is, uh, I have a, an Oval Office set at my studio. It's a full size, down to the inch replica of the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to shoot the show in the Oval Office, and basically it's going to be an answer to